15th. Sunday, May 15th, that's not this coming Sunday, but the following one, and go through the 18th. So May 15th through the 18th, put that on your calendar. We've got a couple of weeks uh, back up for our activities there. We still hope to have a good meeting uh, for that. Looking forward to it. Uh, we are just a few days away from the conclusion of uh, the month of May. Uh, we have for our class tonight, we have tonight's session, next week's session, then we'll have our gospel meeting, and then we'll have one more meeting, one more night of class before our summer series begins. Uh, the summer begins on a Wednesday night this year, June 1st, and uh, so uh, this will be our, we're, we're coming up on the, the end. So what I'm planning to do, I'll just give you a little heads up here. Uh, tonight in our discussion, I'm going to do an introduction to the, uh, the, the last books of wisdom, uh, the book of uh, Song of Solomon. And uh, then next week, Lord willing, we will do an introduction to the book of Psalms and spend one more week in Psalms, the very last week of the month, before we uh, go into the, uh, the summertime. Um, while we're talking about calendar, um, I'm going to be out of pocket this coming week. We have some ac special activities. The uh, Lonnie is going to be hosting um, the area-wide youth gathering will take place here at Maysville Sunday evening. You'll hear an announcement about that in a minute. Um, Thought it was my hearing aid I need to turn down for a minute. <laughs> Had just that right pitch. Ashley, glad to see you. You can bring him down here. We can wake everybody up. We need that occasionally. Um, second time in a month. I've completely lost my train of thought. Uh, Sunday night. You pro we have not been involved in the area-wide uh, youth activities for the Madison County area, but uh, Lonnie signed us up this year, and so Maysville will be hosting that activity this coming Sunday evening. Uh, Lonnie said expect somewhere between 100 and 200 guests to be joining us during our Sunday evening service and then some activities to follow. And so he's going to be uh, taking care of that Sunday night. Um, a couple of months ago, he made a special request uh, to speak Sunday morning because of some uh, folks he was planning to have here, and uh, we accommodated that. So I accepted a speaking engagement out in Texas, and I'll be gone this week and uh, look forward to seeing you on next Wednesday. A couple of uh, people notes. Um, Tony Adair had surgery on his shoulder. Monday, Tuesday, Tuesday, I guess. And uh, he has now gone home from the hospital and doing well. Arlene Kilpatrick will be released from uh, the rehabilitation part of the hospital tomorrow and will be back home again. And uh, she will continue to need some, some special support and uh, make sure that you remember her. I think that's all that's on my mental list. Let's begin in prayer, and then we will do our study for the night. Our Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the day. We are thankful for the gifts and the blessings of life. Father, we are still so mindful of those who live in our area and throughout the state who have been impacted by the storms of last week. We pray that you will continue to be with those who have lost so much, that you'll provide comfort to them by whatever means um, they need through friends and neighbors, through reliance upon you, from help that comes from many sources, we pray that you will provide for them. Father, we're grateful for the care that you've provided for our church family here at Maysville. We ask that you will help us to reach out to those that we are able to, but also to be thankful and grateful for the many gifts that we have in life. 
Father, we thank you for the church here at Maysville, for the blessings that come to us because of our fellowship, for the faith that we share and the challenges that lay before us that we will take up together. We pray that you will help us to be strong, to be bold as we press the gospel into our community and throughout the world. Thank you for the elders who watch over and lead this congregation. We pray that you will bless them with strength, with courage, with long life, with wisdom, that they will boldly carry us forward and help us as we go about doing the work that we should. Father, we are mindful of those who have special needs in our own congregation physically. We ask that you will continue to be with Sister Erlene Kilpatrick and you will strengthen her as she comes home, that you'll provide for her needs. Father, we ask that you will be with uh, Tony and help him to recover from his surgical procedure. Father, we ask your continued blessings to be with Delois Doherty, that you will hold her closely in your hand and pour out richly upon her the blessings that she needs, that you will watch over and provide for her and her family. Father, we are mindful of life. We realize that our lives are fragile, that things can change so quickly. Help us to take stock of the gifts that you give us each day and to enjoy and use the days that you have provided. Father, we ask that you'll forgive us of our sins as we walk in this life that we will live worthy lives of the calling that you've made to us, that we will be lights in the community, that we will share those things that we know about you, and that one day you'll call us home. Father, go with us through this night. Provide for us as we have needs. Forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When we begin to look at the Old Testament and its divisions, we can, depending on how we divide it, come up with several breakdowns. In the New Testament, Jesus spoke of the Law and the Prophets, and that would have accommodated what at that time was all of the Old Testament. And that leaves out a section of material that we sometimes call the wisdom literature, which we have been studying for some time. The wisdom literature would include Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. Now, we have already spent time on the book of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. Uh, we will hopefully spend at least a couple of weeks on the... Uh, the book of Psalms, that leaves us the Song of Solomon. I was anticipating an audience that did not dip below about 25 years of age. I see that Brother Jones is not with us tonight, and many of his class are in our midst. Um, the Song of Solomon is probably one of the most challenging topics to discuss under normal conditions, and now we are under abnormal conditions. I'm semi-inclined to dismiss the young ones to the, another room, but I won't. Instead, I will uh, make sure that I tailor my remarks uh, to be appropriate for a, uh, a mixed group, and uh, we'll stay on that topic. Song of Solomon. How many of you have read the Song of Solomon all the way through? Uh, that that puts you on the spot. If you've read all the way through your Bible, you've read the Song of Solomon. How many of you have read by choice, you just chose as a devotional reading in the last year or two to read the Song of Solomon? Now let me see those hands. Count them on one hand. And I'll have mine down because I have not done so. I have read it through many times and in preparation for this discussion another couple of times. But it is not material that as a rule I go to seeking uh, the reading of, for a devotional nature. It is not that kind of material as, as a rule. It is fairly short. I didn't do the count, but I saw the statistic. It said there's 117 verses uh, listed in the uh, Song of Solomon. Um, you probably have a little introduction of the, uh, the Song of Solomon in your Bible if you have a Bible that has any kind of notes in it. And it will tell you some things like uh, the word canticles uh, and canticum, from which we get, came from Latin, which means a song. 
And sometimes it is described as the Song of Songs rather than the Song of Solomon. In the Old Testament, Hebrew, it was just listed as songs. Uh, I have a couple of quotes regarding this. A couple of guys with the name of Kyle and Dalich uh, have a commentary on the Old Testament. It covers all of the Old Testament books. And uh, is very scholarly, um, widely read in, in many circles. Dalich says concerning the Song of Solomon that it represents one of the most difficult hermeneutical challenges of the Old Testament. The word hermeneutical, which our debate uh, group would be able to describe for you uh, very easily, hermeneutical describes the concept of, of taking the text of Scripture and understanding it, making sense of it. It is the process of interpretation. The Song of Solomon is not difficult to read. It is not difficult to read the words. The problem is understanding what's going on. What's taking place in this book? It has been described as the most obscure of the Old Testament books. Um, a lot of people, in trying to explain the Song of Solomon, res resort to allegory. They want to say, well, it is like, and it's telling this story. But that's a difficult process. What it appears to me, and I'm going to shorten our introduction to get us into the text. What it appears to me, the Song of Solomon is, is a, a song, a poem, regarding the relationship between Solomon the king and an unnamed woman. She will only be identified as the Shulamite. It is about their betrothal, about their wedding, about some of the struggles that go on in their relationship and the development of the very intimate sexual relation between the man and the woman. And uh, as it unfolds, there's going to be several parts. One of the big challenges of reading the book is figuring out who's saying what. Now, if you're reading from the King James Version Bible, you really do have a challenge uh, when it comes to the Song of Solomon because there are very few helps there. If you have a newer version, a modern speech version or even uh, the new King James Version in many, I don't know if it goes back to 1983. Anybody have the original Nelson 1983 publication of the new King James? Do you know whether or not you do in your hand? Anybody? The original 1983 version, Jimmy? Okay. In Song of Solomon, does it give the breakouts for Shulamite, the beloved or the lover or something like that? Okay. Uh, later on, it does and it provides you those helps. What we're going to see as we go through the book is we're going to have at least three people speaking. And there's going to be no... Uh, help telling you who's speaking when. Those three speakers are going to be the woman who is betrothed to Solomon. Solomon himself, who is the lover or the beloved. And then you're going to have uh, the daughters of Jerusalem, which appears to be a chorus kind of thing. And so we have this, this sort of play uh, acted out where we have several things that take place. There is the betrothal where they um, describe each other and their beauty and their longing for one another. They ha then we go to the wedding night or the wedding itself, which is, is very brief, and, and then the honeymoon period where they are together and enraptured in one another's love. Then we also have two dream sections, or at least what appear to be dream sections. The first dream occurs perhaps prior to the wedding, if not immediately after. And uh, the woman loses or she fears that she has lost her man and she goes out to find him and does find him and bring him back. And then the second one 
is apparently after they're married, but there are some problems. Uh, as we come into this chapter, and that section is down in chapter 5, uh, beginning in chapter 5, verse 2, down through verse 16, we have the second dream, where it would appear from the reading there that, uh, that the man has uh, approached her, um, and she was reluctant to respond, and so he has gone away. And so now she has to go out and search for him and find him. So we have these two dreams, and the whole thing, all of the book of Solomon, or the Song of Solomon, is about the physical relationship between uh, the woman and the man, both in description of themselves and their, their, uh, in a general statement, uh, you are beautiful, we, I love you, I care for you, you smell good, you look good, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. And then some very specific physical characteristics, describing her hair, her teeth, her skin, her, her body in various descriptions. Uh, thinking of my audience here. And uh, then their relationships with, with one another. Uh, finally, the chapter closes with uh, their relationship restored, love reunited, uh, chapter 6, verse 1, through the end. Then we'll make some practical ob observations if we've got any time left. I'm not going to read all of the text, but I want to give you a feel for what the text is and uh, in our study. Some of you, I'm sure, have no idea that material like this is in the Bible. You will tonight. The Song of Songs, which is Solomon's, chapter 1, verse 1. I'm going to use the headings that are in the text. Okay. Now, when I say in my text, I don't mean it is part of the inspired scriptures. I mean that the translators have put in some helps so that a reader later on can, can figure out what's taking place here as they understand it. So there can be some debate here as to whether or not this is exactly right, but it appears to fit, and I'm in basic agreement with it. First, the discussion from the Shulamite, and this is uh, the woman, a young Palestinian woman of unnamed, we don't know who she is, whether this is literal or figurative, is unidentified. Surely this would have come very early in Solomon's life as he's writing these kinds of things uh, as we uh, see his life decline later. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is better than wine. Because of the fragrance of your good ointments, your name is ointment poured forth. Therefore, the virgins love you. Draw me away. The imagery here, and, and we remember we're doing A, poetry, B, uh, a song, both of which are uh, intended to be interpreted, maybe not in a in in an absolutely literal way, but in a poetic way. For some of you, it's a big stretch. For others of you, you had not got there yet. For the rest, do you remember what it was like to date? And do you remember what it was like to date someone that you didn't know very well and you were enthralled by being around them? A telephone call, their name, a letter. I can remember back, especially in uh, high school, uh, being around the guys and the girls. And it, of course, it happens at Lads to Leaders. You walk down the hallway at uh, in the Opperland Hotel and have a group of teenagers pass you by. And if fragrance was visible they would disappear into a cloud. And as they come, sometimes the, the smell comes before they do. If the wind is from their back blowing through the, uh, down the hallways, you begin to smell the fragrances. 
And every teenager coming down the hall smells like they fell into a bottle of perfume. Okay, it's a little bit of an uh, exaggeration, but not too much. And so the, this cloud of fragrance passes you by, and it, it's overwhelming. You pass a group of married folk, do they smell like that? No. Why not? Well, for most of us, uh, at some point in time, we tone down the smells. Uh, I got into a car when I was at uh, Fried Hardeman and drove several. We were all, all the group in there was single. They got into my car. I had to roll the window down because of all the, the smells. A couple of guys, a couple of girls, and it was just, it was overwhelming. Well, that's part of the passion of, of youth and, and sexual attraction. And this book is about sexual attraction. That, that intoxication with all of the senses. You look good. You smell good. I intend to taste you. I want to feel you. There, there is a, a complete immersion into the senses of this book. The passion of love is what's described. So she says, I want you to kiss me. I want to smell you. I want to taste you. Uh, your name the way the girls, the word virgin in the Old Testament usually, not always, usually only describes the young women, uh, the women who are not yet married. So when you talk about a virgin, uh, that was, generally speaking, an unmarried girl. Now there's some technical issues that go with that. She's also sexually inexperienced if she's unmarried. But it is not so much the sexual aspect of it as if she's unmarried. She is the young, that is the young women. So here's this guy, and all the young girls, they just swoon over him. Just the, just the name that he uses. His name uh, causes them to just go, oh. she's in love. Draw me away. The daughters of Jerusalem, we will run after you. The girl speaks again, the Shulamite. The king has brought me into his chambers. Daughters of Jerusalem, beginning of verse 4, uh, middle of verse 4. We will be glad and rejoice in you. We will remember your love more than wine. When we get to the we sections, you're going, we're going to assume that that's the, the chorus of the, the girls uh, hanging out there. Any statement made by the, the girl herself is a, uh, from her toward him. When he speaks to her, he'll describe her physical attributes and her qualities. The Shulamite. Now we have a, a longer section. Rightly do they love you. She's describing here. But interestingly enough, as soon as we begin to describe she's in love with him, there is a, there is a drawback. She does not consider herself to be beautiful. Now in this particular case, her limitations from beauty stem from the fact that she has been worked outside. I don't know if you know this or not, probably some of you do. It has not always been an admirable quality to have a good tan. Now today, people pay large amounts of money to go lay on a, and I've never been around one really, I can only describe them from general observation, lay on a bed or on a glass device that has light bulbs above and below, and it cooks them with infrared radiation to cause them to tan. We call them tanning beds. I won't ask for a show of hands how many of you tan in the tanning beds. Those who may not go to the tanning beds may go out of the sunshine itself and, and use El Sol, the, uh, the natural tanning way. We, we want to have that dark outside look. I had a lady years ago when I was preaching in Duluth, and uh, she would always say about me, oh, you, you've got a good, healthy glow. You don't have that preacher pallor. 
What she meant by that was I was not pasty. No, I usually worked outside, and so in the summertime, I'd get red. I'll, they'll also cut skin cancers off of me as I age, like they have off of some of you. That's the problem of, of uh, being exposed to the sun. Nice ladies, uh, wealthy women, stayed out of the sun. And even as much as a generation ago, some of you ladies grew up where you protected your skin. They did not want their skin to become brown. Why not? If you were brown, that meant you were a working person and that you had been sent out into the fields. You were a field hand. Cultured women kept their skin white and untanned. Listen how she describes herself. Verse 5. I am dark but lovely, O daughters of Jerusalem, like the tents of cedar, like the curtains of Solomon. Do not look upon me because I am dark, because the sun has tanned me. My mother's sons were angry with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyard I have not kept. She says, I have been sent out and I had to work and because I had to work, I've, I'm tanned and so I don't have that, that light color skin. I, I'm, I bear the mark of, of having been out and been pushed into work. But don't look down on me because I don't have the fair skin. And her beloved says to her in verse 7, Tell me, O oh, you whom I love, where you feed your flock, where you make it... Uh, sorry, I've given you the wrong uh, statement. She is now saying this to her, to her man. Tell me, O oh, whom, you whom I love, where you feed your flock, where you make it uh, rest at noon. Why should I be as one who veils herself by the flocks of your companions? And now he responds to her. If you do not know, O fairest among women, follow in the footsteps of the flock and feed your little goats beside the shepherd tents. I have compared you, my love, to my filly among Pharaoh's chariots. Your cheeks are lovely with your ornaments, your neck with chains of gold. He sees her as beautiful and says, You are the prettiest woman in Jerusalem, the fairest of them all. What does any woman want to hear from her husband? Or from her man. I'm assuming here. Y'all can pummel me later if I'm mistaken. She wants to believe that she is found beautiful in his sight. And that's how he describes her. You are my beauty. You are the one who I long for. Okay, we will make you ornaments of gold with studs of silver. The Shunammite, verse 12. While the king is at his table, my spikenard sends forth its fragrance. She describes herself, verses 12 through 14, in the terms of a fragrance. I, I smell good. I, I am sending myself out to him. While the king is at his table, my fragrance sends forth. A bundle of myrrh is my beloved to me. He smells good. That lies all night between my breasts. My beloved is to me a cluster of henna blooms. In the vineyards of Engedi. The beloved back to her. Behold, you are fair, my love. Behold, you are fair. You have dove's eyes. Her to him. Behold, you are handsome, my beloved. Yes, pleasant. Also, our bed is green. The beams of our houses are cedar and our rafters of fir. I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. Back and forth, the, uh, the conversation goes between him and her as they see each other and their, um, their love. All right, let's go down to... Um, um, I, I guess we should start in verse 4. She's going to describe her relationship with him. He brought me into the banquet house. His banner over me was love. Sustain me with cakes of raisins. Refresh me with apples for I am lovesick. His left hand is under my head. His right hand embraces me. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or the does of the field, do not stir up nor awaken love until it pleases. 
And she speaks again, The voice of my beloved, behold, he comes, leaping upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle, a gazelle or a young stag. Behold, he stands behind our wall. He is looking through the windows, gazing through the lattice. He is looking at her. She's envisioning, of course, we have several layers here, Solomon writing it, but as he writes, of the girl, the girl is envisioning her lover looking through the, the, the lattice at her and desiring her. This picture of longing. My beloved spoke and said to me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. For lo, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone, the flowers appear on the earth, the time of singing has come, the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land, the fig tree puts forth uh, her green uh, figs, etc., and we have this discussion. All right. Till finally we come down to uh, the, uh, the night before the wedding. It's possible that uh, the wedding has already happened, but it appears more likely that the wedding part comes in verses 6 through 11. And here is the, what goes on. Who is this coming out of the wilderness like pillars of smoke perfumed with myrrh and frankincense? I am in chapter 3, verse 6. Behold, it is Solomon's couch with 60 valiant men around it. Of the valiant of Israel, they all hold swords, being experts in war. Every man has his sword on his thigh because of the fear in the night. Of the wood of, of Lebanon, King uh, Solomon the king made himself, wow, a palanquin. I don't know what that is. I was reading another version as I prepared myself tonight. That's a new word. My note says a portable enclosed chair. Okay. I think the one I said he said his throne. He made its pillars of silver, its supports of gold. Go forth, daughters of Jerusalem, um, to him. All right. It's the wedding day. On the day of his wedding, the day of the gladness of his heart. All right. So the night before is in chapter 3, verse 1. By night on my bed, I sought the one I love. I sought him, but I did not find him. I will rise now, I said, and go about the city. In the streets and in the squares, I will find the one I love. I sought for him, but I did not find him. The watchmen who go about the city found me. I said, have you seen the one I love? Scarcely had I passed by them when I found the one I love. I held him and would not let him go until I had brought him to the house of my mother and into the chamber of her who conceived me. All right, so she's, she's afraid on her wedding night that she's going to lose her husband. But she finds him. They get married, and then chapter 4 is the, the night. Uh, and the, the greatest discussion of, of uh, interaction between the man and the woman occur in, verse, in chapter 4 uh, as they describe each other's qualities. You may not like teeth that look like sheep or hair that looks like the goats coming out of the hills of Lebanon. That may not sound very romantic to you. Uh, but you've got to remember that they hadn't seen the movies yet, okay? They, hadn't, they didn't have the Hollywood imagery. So you use the images of the day. You have these, these sheep coming out of the water. What color are sheep? Eh, ideally. Most of the sheep I've been around look, you know, yucky. They're, but if you've seen the shorn sheep where they've been freshly shaved and their wool underneath, all the old dirty wool is gone and now you have the, have the nice white wool underneath. Um, and uh, they, they come up out of the water and they are all evenly shorn and they are twins, there's no gaps. And he's describing her teeth. You have these beautiful white teeth. They look like white sheep coming up out of the river. Okay, that may not do anything for you today, but apparently it did back in the day and uh, you know your mouth is lovely your lips are like a strand of scarlet verse 3 your temples behind your veil are like a piece of pomegranate great I'm fruit your neck is like the tower of David built for an armory on which hang a thousand bucklers what are we talking about here a wrestler <laughs> he's describing her qualities that she is she's strong she is lovely it doesn't work with us. Our imagery is just a little different, but we have it nonetheless.
thousands of them. She, she is decked out like she is, uh, has the, the shields of Solomon there. You know, she's covered in gold. Um, and, you know, back to fragrances again, and there's a lot of discussion of gardens and of the various things that grow in the gardens, and it's all metaphor for the uh, sexual interaction between him and her. Okay, we'll, uh, we'll let that go. Uh, after the, uh, the wedding and all of the things that happened, we have the next dream. It occurs again in, uh, you can tell what has happened, the, the, ar the arousal of, of love, verse 16, awake north wind, come, O south, blow upon my garden and let its spices flow out that my beloved may come into his garden, eat his blessed fruit. I've come into my garden, chapter 5, verse 1. I've gathered my myrrh and my spice. I've eaten my honeycomb with my honey. I've drunk my wine with my milk. The, uh, they're ravished in each other's love. The last uh, dream begins in verse 2. I sleep, but my heart is awake. Is it the voice of my beloved? He knocks, saying, open for me. Let me make an observation about my sister. Don't let that throw you off. This is not an incestuous thing. My sister, my love. There's a description in the Old Testament of, of uh, family in more than one way. When uh, Abraham uh, was growing old and his son Isaac was living in the land of uh, the, uh, Palestine, Abraham did not want Isaac to marry one of the local girls. He wanted instead to go back and select someone from my father's house. Go back and get a, a relative, someone who's come from our family, our stock. Uh, not a foreigner, not a stranger, not, uh, not someone who with a foreign god or someone else. This is not, in a, in a physical sense, a literal sister. It is a, of us. My kind of people. You are, you are like me. You're not a foreigner. You are, you are mine. And so this phrase, my sister, my love, occurs about ten different times. And each time it is descriptive of you are, you are close to me. You are from my group. Um, he knocks, he calls, open my sister, my love, my dove, my perfect one, for my head is covered with dew, my locks with the drops of the night. I've taken off my robe, can I put it on again? I've washed my feet, should I defile them? The description goes on, I'm not going to go very deep into this because it gets rather graphic if you figure out what's going on. In her dream, she imagines that her husband now is, is approaching her uh, for physical interaction and she rebuffs him. Uh, she does not open to him, and he leaves. And then as she comes up, and as she gets out of her bed and comes to find him, he's gone. And now she goes into the city just like the dream before, but instead of finding him immediately, she finds the watchman of the gate, and they beat her up. And it is only after some time that she is finally reunited with her lover because she has turned him away. And so there has some, there's trouble, there's some trauma in the relationship because of, uh, of their physical interaction. Finally, they are restored. Where has your beloved gone? Chapter 6, verse 1. O fairest among women, where has your beloved turned aside that we may seek him with you? Chapter 6, verse 2. My beloved has gone to his garden, to the bed of spices, to feed his flock in the gardens, to gather lilies. I am my beloved, my beloved is mine. He feeds his flocks among the lilies. And then in chapter 6, verse 4, from then on, uh, she is described again, Oh, you, my love, you're beautiful, you're lovely, you are um, returned. And uh, it, it goes on with the, the beginning, like we had at the beginning. And that's, that's the Song of Solomon. Now, we haven't delved into it, and there's lots of, of detail there. Is there a practical application we can make for the Song of Solomon? In the minutes, okay, maybe seconds, we have left. Let me just make a couple of observations. One, God made us as sexual beings. This really wasn't the forum I intended to address this in, but perhaps it's, it's just as well for our youngest ones to be in here. God made us as sexual beings. Now, one of our speakers this Wednesday night 
um, is going to be addressing the fact that our culture is, I think the title of his lesson is Overexposed. The fact that uh, in our culture there is way too much emphasis on open sexuality. In the book of Genesis, chapter 1, God says, let us make man in our image. In chapter 2, he makes them male and female, and they are joined together, the husband and the wife, and they are naked and unashamed. God created them as sexual beings. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4, it is clear that the concept of God regarding marriage is that marriage is appropriate. Not only is marriage appropriate, but that the action of the physical relationship between a, man, a married man and a married woman is appropriate. Marriage is honorable before all, and the marriage bed is undefiled. It is not inappropriate, it is appropriate. When Jesus addresses this topic in Matthew chapter 19, in the discussion regarding, or that, that's prompted by divorce, but then he follows up on it, he says, Have you not read that he who made them from the beginning made them male and female? When we talk about sex, who made it? God did. God made sex. Now, did God make anything that was not good? In the description that we have back in the creation of, uh, of man and woman, the only thing stated that wasn't good was when man was alone in the Garden of Eden, and God said it is not good for the man to be alone. And he made a woman suitable for him, a companion suitable for him. Men and women are made suitable for each other. That needs to be discussed in our society today. The passions that men and women should have for one another are to be fulfilled in marriage. It is intended that men and women marry, uh, that it be permanent. For this cause a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife. The two shall become one flesh. And what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. Don't take it apart. Why? Malachi chapter 2, when God describes to Israel what was wrong with their relationship, He says, I have turned away from your sacrifices because you have divorced the wife of your youth. You have treated the woman, uh, and He's addressing the men, you have treated the woman that you married from the time you were a young man with contempt. And because you have now treated her with contempt, God says, I will not receive your sacrifices. It's interesting that when Peter writes uh, concerning husbands and wives in 1 Peter chapter 3, and he describes how wives should act toward their husband, especially those who are not members of the church, not mem uh, members of the body, that you may win your husband without a word, then he turns to husbands in verse 7. And he says, Husbands, live with your wives with understanding, honoring them as the weaker vessel, that your prayers be not hindered. Our relationship to God in marriage will affect our relationship to God. If you do not treat your marriage partner appropriately, God is the judge of that. God intended for us to be married. Also in Malachi chapter 2, God says, the reason why I am upset because of the divorce is you have brought violence upon your family. Divorce is a violent thing. And second, he said, I desire godly offspring. It is in the bounds of marriage that children are supposed to come forth, despite what Hollywood says. Children are supposed to come forth from marriage. And it is only within the sacredness of a stable home with mom and dad and children that those children will find their ultimate fulfillment in life. There are scores of books written about the trauma of divorce upon children, even grown children. They never outgrow it. It will always be a burden that they carry. God intends for us to stay uh, married. And then another observation we would certainly want to make regarding that is, uh, is the backside. Um, God will judge fornicators. When we talk about fornication, that's the first bell or the second. Nobody's coming in. I've, I guess I better quit. 
Okay. 30 seconds. Fornication is the description of inappropriate sexual contact. God said in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4, marriage is undefiled, marriage is honorable, the bed is undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. It is clear that while sexuality is a gift to humanity, it is not one that we are free to use however we want to do so. God will hold us accountable for our actions. And it is only within the married bounds that human sexuality is intended to be met as God's gift. An introduction to the Song of Solomon. There's lots left. But thank you for your time and attention. Uh, your comments. Next week, Lord willing, we will uh, spend some time introducing the book of Psalms and have just a tidbit uh, to look at in the next couple of weeks. Thank you.